And uh, okay, uh, module six, we are going to focus on uh, more metabolomics specific uh, data analysis. And um, so uh, we're going to cover three uh, topics. One is um, uh, basic steps in uh, IOCMS spectral processing. And um, then we are going to focus on functional analysis. So one is for quantity metabolomics. And this is uh, basically the concentrations we collected yesterday. How we move from the peak tables, uh, from tables of compound concentrations, a list of significant compounds to their functions. And the last one is how we actually do the functional analysis for the on-target metabolomics direct from LCMS peaks. So overall, that um, the module five, we teach the statistics and um, uh, machine learning, which is neutral. You can mostly apply to um, metabolomics and to other omics. Now we are going to focus on more metabolomics specific. And although metabolomics have some unique things like on target and, on, and the targeted. So um, my emphasis here is that uh, raw data processing uh, like uh, is different. So uh, LCMS spectral processing you are going to learn is uh, unique and we try to make it as smooth, automated as, as, as easy as possible. But yesterday you used uh, uh, the GCLC outfit uh, magmat to do that. That's uh, really unique. Now, after that, we are going to do the functional analysis. Disregarding, I'm having two different topics about quantitative metabolomics and uh, LCMS on targeted metabolomics. You should feel some similarity. And the concept of the enrichment analysis is actually very similar. And we try to overall that we want to make you feel there's a consistent patterns and you can almost leverage to across. So uh, don't need to... Uh, always think this and that, but there's consistent framework disregarding the data input. So uh, metabolomics, uh, uh, here uh, shows some metabolomic experiment. I just mentioned about, we cannot do studies at, at one samples or one replicate. We usually need to do a lot of replicates and um, a cohort. So a lot of samples give you a confidence because uh, at a representative of a uh, of a population, so you can extrapolate using the p-values. And the metabolomics also sometimes have the technical replicates just because uh, at the early days and um, the stability of the machine is not that uh, so high and we need to have technical replicates. So we need to have like a lot of times early days we talk about triplicates and they have an average. Nowadays, it seems less common, but it's still um, a lot of time. So we do have biological replicates and techno replicates, okay? And uh, you see these slides yesterday, and we do have targeted quantity metabolomics and on target, sometimes we call it global metabolomics. So um, data generation, uh, after data generation, uh, on target metabolomics uh, using a uh, calibration curve and internal standard actually get absolute quantification. And uh, you use a constitutional table and uh, do the pathway analysis, uh, statistical analysis, you get biomarkers and pathways uh, probably quite similar to what you have, we have done with uh, gene expression data. For on target metabolomics, um, there's some slight difference from the peaks and we want to directly use that, them to find the patterns. Then we try to annotate only those significant peaks because the annotating peaks and identify them it takes in some time. It's, uh, it is, um, how to say, this is a one of the bottlenecks. Uh, but today we want to more or less share the similar workflow. So we can uh, um, almost from peaks directly to the uh, functions without uh, uh, doing an extra step. So you all feel it uh, with the, uh, the this, uh, after we finish that, uh, uh, finish this module. <clears throat> So metabolic analysts are designed to work for almost the most common type of data matrix, uh, matrices, okay? And uh, for uh, targeted metabolomics, you generate a constitutional table, you can direct upload. And sometimes you need to add in some labels if you don't have label. For MR and uh, especially on-target MMR, you can do a spectral binning. You can actually use, using some uh, 
uh, algorithm to, to chop into individual things. And for LCMS or LCMS uh, metabolomic data, and you can upload either pick list, you use your vendor provided software or some proprietary software or whatever software you would like to do uh, to use and upload the pick list. And you can sometimes manually annotate some of them. So it's done to really matter. And uh, the next one is uh, you can also upload the raw spectra. So this is uh, um, really untargeted and uh, the format must be in a common format or open open public format, MZML, MZXML, or um, MZ data. So we don't support in the propriety just because uh, they are proprietary. So, so now we are starting LCMS uh, raw spectrum for data processing. And um, yesterday, uh, David already mentioned about uh, what uh, the LCMS uh, spectra um, uh, looks like. It is very large and noisy. So if you do use a high resolution ones, you actually can um, get a gig, uh, gigabytes of size for the uh, LC high resolution one. So it's quite uh, uh, unnecessary if you need to upload the data like this and do the processing. And the, uh, what we need to do uh, for LC um, uh, MS spectra is actually we need to find the MS features. And these features are usually defined by their M to Z ratios and the retention time and intensity. And uh, you can see on the left side, you do see each peak actually have this two dimensional coordinate, which is their tentative ID or tag. You have this retention time, have this M to uh, Z uh, uh, ratio. And uh, this is really the unit for our untargeted data analysis. Um, but keep in mind that each compound can give rise to multiple mass signals. So David mentioned about uh, neutral loss and uh, ADEX and isotopes. So they are actually all very informative. We can use these uh, signals actually to do the data, uh, compound annotation. And uh, uh, if um, hopefully next year we are going to um, give you the MS2 and how do we leverage this to do a, a compound annotation. So overall that, uh, all of this is called MS features. They are not, uh, they are not noises. They are useful for doing a um, common, uh, common uh, annotation and the functional analysis. So uh, the purpose of processing the raw MS data is to identify, quantify, and align all these MS features and across all the samples. And we would like to get a table of these uh, features and indexed by their retention time and Z value with their quantitative information for subsequent uh, statistical analysis. The quantitative information here, we, we talk about their peak height or peak uh, area, okay? We do understand they are not uh, absolute quantification, but uh, within the same equipment, uh, within the same batch, they are actually comparable. So they do suffer from some uh, matrix effect, but overall that if we talk about they are similar matrix, same type of samples running through the same machine, they are comparable and the statistics uh, can be performed robustly. So it's just not compare across different studies, across different locations, across different machines. That's the limitation, but overall that within the same machine, within the same matrix running through the like a uh, uh, same day, it should be very uh, stable. Nowadays, the machine is uh, actually quite uh, robust. And now you with some internal standard, you should be able to achieve a stability um, of the spectrum. If that's not, and you need to calibrate your machine. So a profile of centroid. So uh, I think uh, David mentioned that uh, I, you are we're probably going to cover a bit on this is uh, we don't upload the raw spectra to the um, to the uh, metabolist. Also, uh, the raw spectra generated from machine is called a profile, and we need to centroid. So centroid is really um, convert uh, uh, the MS data into a centroid mode to uh, condense the Gaussian profile into a centroid. And uh, how do we do that? We use the Proteum Wizard. So you must, uh, if you deal with the raw data, you need to install it and do the conversion. 
so this is a very versatile you can use the widely used in proteomics and metabolomics so we are not going to um, ask you to do that because our data is all open public format so if you really need that you should uh, uh, do, uh, should uh, uh, download that which is uh, quite uh, commonly used now uh, what are the options to do that broad spectral processing and uh, here is several most popular one uh, all three xms and uh, probably the oldest one and uh, it was um, uh, first released 2006 and uh, then there's new ones called mzmi now it's version 3 and ms dial and uh, open ms open ms is originally de de developed for the um, proteomics but now it is adapt to metabolomics also so all of this uh, can process the the raw spectra so uh, we are going to focus on XMS. Uh, why is that uh, metabol analyst actually the, currently the underlying algorithm is based on XMS. We also do a lot of the uh, evaluations on different tools. We do feel XMS is uh, very robust and efficient and uh, across a different platforms, both high resolution and low resolution is okay. And we also uh, closely follow the development of this uh, um, uh, tools we have a lot of optimizations and parameters so we are very comfortable to um, to uh, offer this just because we use it internally a lot <clears throat> so as also xms have a largest community have a lot of the helps and uh, you can use L uh, for lcms and ms and ms and the multi-reaction monitoring isotope labeling so it's very very versatile and uh, the r <clears throat> the r package is well documented and uh, um, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a uh, quite a uh, uh, quite a handy, and uh, you can modify to different purpose. So if you go to XMS and uh, see that how they design originally, and uh, this is a overall high level flow. You're reading the uh, raw MS data. It's we are talking about the MZ MZML or CDF, and uh, you do the peak, peak detection. And peak detection is uh, um, for individual samples. Now we need to do a peak matching and across the different uh, um, different samples because this could be a shift in the retention time. After that, you need to do some retention time correction and alignment. So make sure the uh, peaks generated by same compounds will be uh, compared across. Right? If you miss that, then basically you're comparing apple versus our, um, oranges. So peak alignment is uh, uh, quite a peak alignment and peak feeling. So uh, after you align the uh, peaks, you will, meet, you will notice uh, some peaks actually presented across a lot of samples, but missing in other samples. So you should uh, guess that peaks probably also present. So you can actually ask the algorithm to zoom in to that region, try to re extract that peaks. So overall that uh, this, uh, Peak detection, peak alignment, and peak feeling is an iterative a few times to get a good result. Overall, that uh, uh, it performed well. And after that, you get a peak intensity table. And we can do peak uh, uh, statistical analysis and direct from that. Of course, we can also do the annotation from that uh, uh, result. So uh, one of the most uh, uh, important uh, algorithms uh, in uh, um, XMS is called the Uh There are some other algorithms for peak detection called the matched filter, which is designed for low resolution uh, spectra. But the wave is really uh, at least uh, at the moment, at the time when they, uh, I think 2010, the design is for the high resolution. Uh, I think uh, nowadays our resolution is much higher than that time. I think that's for TOF probably in mind designed for that. So the sand wave algorithm actually working very well for um, at the time. And uh, they consider a lot of the factors and the peak height shape and uh, how to define our signals. And overall, they have uh, many, I think 13 or 14 different parameters overall to tune to find the best performing uh, combinations. And uh, this part is actually scared a lot of people away. And uh, at the early days, we per, we doing this metabolomic workshop, and this part is actually most most challenging. 
And just because I myself, I can write all the code, understand it, but I just don't understand why you choose that parameter because I, it's dependent on data and dependent on the machine. And the different machine, different data, and have different, even people have different preferences. So uh, uh, the issue for this is uh, uh, the XMS group from the scripts, they actually have a default for different type of machine, like uh, TOF, Objective, they have different default. But we also find that even default doesn't work uh, across same type of machine because uh, sample also important and parameter column also important. So overall, that's the best way to do is actually make it automated. We automated the whole thing based on your data, based on the specific um, starting from your sample uh, instrument default. Then we optimize based on data. And uh, this is uh, uh, actually um, you are going to use is that we want to be auto optimization workflow. So you upload the data and have a very high level define uh, what's the uh, instrument type or what's the uh, positive negative mode or, or, or stuff. And we will do optimization and get the best parameter to get it out. Rather than, you, rather than ask you to specify a parameter you have no idea about. Actually, most people will find it hard to do and you need to test multi times. But uh, as I mentioned, when you talk about a try and error and a repeat, and the uh, machine can do it very well. And uh, so how do we actually do that? Is uh, um, we need to find the signals that uh, we believe is more likely to be true. And we want to pick up the signals, uh, pick up these peaks and uh, try to evaluate whether this kind of set of parameters get the peaks that looks like real, right? And we also do not want to use the whole spectrum. You, uh, because in LCMS, high resolution ones, you see most places don't have signals. They are flat, the baseline, have a lot of noises. What we would like to, to do is just use in some regions randomly, uh, but we focus on the regions that contain real signals and they use this signal to train the algorithm to get the parameters. So you can see here, we show that um, uh, we found out the regions that contain signals and we just extract them. And you can see at a high level, they contain signal, but in between is both high and low signals will be there. So that's sufficient. We don't use the whole spectrum because you are including a lot of, lot of the baseline noises. So we just choose the regions that contain the real signals. Then we start a, start a chain. How do we, how do we um, find the best combination of the, uh, 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 the values for these parameters? So, um, uh, there's uh, a lot of the parameter to, to train, and I think uh, uh, we have choose the most important eight. This one. Yeah. And you can see it's a peak width, peak uh, height, and, uh, and uh, MZ difference, and uh, signal to noise threshold, and a lot of uh, several other things we found it most meaningful. And we try to train, uh, update different values from the default. Then we computed the quality scores. You can see this quality score. Uh, the QS, which is looks scary, but uh, uh, what they try to do is that uh, make sure this value is being maximized uh, with different, uh, when you choose the values, what they try to maximize it. One is a <clears throat> relative reliable peak ratio, which is identified by the isotopes. So there's a lot of uh, false positives uh, or noise peaks. Uh, David mentioned about if we really uh, try to clean the untargeted metabolome peaks from like uh, uh, 12,000 all the way we can get to 2,500 uh, or even a few thousand. So almost the majority of peaks will be uh, be removed. So they are they are really the noise. So um, that's because one of the things that a lot of regions contains that just based on noise. What the real peaks uh, looks like is that uh, several things. One is they have isotopes. They have isotopic peaks. That means they are more likely to be true, right? This is very clear. The other one is a Gaussian peak ratio. So the peak, real peaks have the Gaussian peak, a Gaussian shape. So it's very uh, uh, tried. And uh, we know as a, um, if you run this, you know that's, uh, that's uh, reliable in uh, identifier. The other one is the coefficient of distribution stability of a group of features. So if we um, find this is a, uh, uh, true things, they should be have a, a stable 
uh, group features. So more or less, we uh, give different weight and we want to make sure these are reliable, not a random features that appear across different QC samples or broad samples. And the Gaussian shape have the have this um, uh, isotopics. So emphasize this one. Once they say have a highest value, then we think uh, that's the best parameter is set. Okay. So um, we use this uh, uh, just empirical um, approaches. Basically, we select the most meaningful regions. We select most the set of the parameters, and we select most meaningful criteria and we optimize it. We just want to see how good they could be. And uh, we compare it with every other available optimization algorithms. Uh, there's definitely a lot of people try to do the same thing. And uh, um, there's OVAT, there's IPU, there's OptiLC mass, which is metabolic R, part of metabolic R. This is called auto tuner. So uh, uh, we can see that uh, metab uh, um, so I can tell you IPO is the one when we developed, we use it. It's running for weeks and without giving you results because you, you use the whole spectrum and you try one and one and really they want to give you the best result, but uh, practically it just cannot finish because the high resolution takes a lot of time and uh, so they just stuck. And, uh, so we want to have a reasonable solution and still get the best result. <clears throat> Overall, that we, we did the optimization, we tried to uh, um, implement algorithms. We tested on a sim sim simple mixture, and this is the standard. This is IBD real sample. They are from this uh, uh, collecting uh, using Obitrap. So we can see our approach is actually uh, quite similar to, uh, uh, to just not, you, you see that you should notice here's the days. And uh, what we can do is a minutes, okay? We can just a few minutes, we can get things done. And uh, and we can see the result using XMS without auto tuning and uh, with uh, optimize this. So we can get actually better high quality peaks with more isotopes, with better more attacks, with more formally assigned. So overall, that um, we uh, we found out uh, the 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 captures better signals and more real peaks. So we actually doing this multiple times. Mo most likely, get, uh, we get the uh, same results like this. Sometimes like times, but then. 10% better, we can get sometimes 20% better. So it it's, uh, feels uh, um, it's uh, uh, working very well. So we are very confident and uh, to uh, put it through our website. Of course, you can do the default and you can do the manual tuning if you know what you're doing. But uh, if you don't know, and like most people, just let the algorithm do the best and they are really good at it. So um, uh, today you are going to the lab and try to, uh, try to upload the not upload, try to use a building example data and to run through the process and feel the result. So the uh, overall that uh, we want to get a result directly into like the PCA, you can see the patterns. So, and you can see some significant peaks and you actually see the each features if you click and what's the, T, um, what's the TIC uh, looks like and what if peaks actually look raw peak at that uh, across different uh, groups. And this is a, a box plot summarizing different groups. And each dot, you can click on it and see the spectra, and just like you are connecting with a machine. So this is a really, if you, you are running the instrument and you, you know this one is uh, make you feel comfortable. But uh, for most of us, I don't think we need to get very detailed under the feature level. But the, the thing that, uh, what we try to design metab analysis is that uh, we hide the complexity, but we don't, uh, uh, but if you want to see it, you can see it. Uh, overall that you can just get a result and we do a lot of the quality check from behind, but uh, everything is there and you can see this, you can see the visualization, you can see the R code, you can see the parameter. So um, uh, once we get MS features across samples, uh, what we can do is basically you open a new door and uh, suddenly you can do almost everything, okay? You have that data, data table, uh, continuous peaks, you can do statistical analysis, which is independent about uh, concentrations or, or the peaks. You can actually do some uh, biomarker analysis. Of course, this biomarker won't be compound. It will be uh, related to some peaks features. You need to spend more time to identify what it is. And you can do functional analysis. And actually, you can do pathway analysis because nowadays, if you high resolution peaks, you can directly map into the pathways and actually very good uh, accuracy. 
And so um, basically after this step, you have a lot to do. And uh, without a, a spend a year to identify all the compounds, you're almost very close to writing your papers. You do need to do some slightly more like MSMS to identify a few more compounds, but uh, but uh, uh, the global untagging metabolomics with the current uh, uh, tools and functions, you're getting very uh, very smooth and uh, streamlined. So uh, what uh, I would like to just mention is that uh, uh, there's a new generation of the spec processing called Asari. This is based on Python, and we are actively evaluating this. And this tool seems 10 times faster, I think. And the result is quite similar to XMS. And uh, probably we are going to uh, put it there in the future, but we still need to understand how we make sure they are performed very well across different uh, uh, platforms. So far, it's designed for the OBCHAP. So uh, the feeling is that uh, uh, if you're doing uh, RNA-seq and you know this algorithm called the CLISTO, before that, uh, you if you do an RNA-seq, you're running in a supercomputer or good a lot of memories. But if you use a CLISTO, you can run it on a laptop and uh, quickly. And uh, it's amazing and hard to believe you can do it. But the result is almost same as using a heavyweight uh, high, uh, the algorithm called a high set or top hat. And uh, the thing is just all about how you uh, program the algorithm and get some redundancy, memory intensive gone. So uh, uh, I, I think that Asari will be published soon. And so far it's on bioarchive. So if you are really eager and uh, hardcore and you are welcome to read it, it seems you, they are using a lot of the <clears throat> high resolution features to, uh, to uh, simplify the analysis. Uh, we don't have question, right? No? Okay, good. So uh, no more questions, let's move on. So we have uh, a peak, and we have compounds, and we want to understand the functions. So functions, uh, uh, what is functions? So this is something we here we show as a, a tag map because uh, yesterday David shows the SMPDB, small compound databases. So we talk about uh, uh, functions. We always think about pathways, talk about uh, biology. So this is uh, almost equivalent. So uh, how do we usually uh, get there is that uh, we need to um, link our individual peaks and the compounds to their groups. The groups is about a metabolite set or gene set, which in uh, our pathways or joint pathways or networks. So once we see they are connected, they are working together, doing something, we know they are doing a function. And uh, so how do we uh, testing whether they, this these groups uh, are active, and we use a process called the uh, uh, called the enrichment analysis. So enrichment analysis is uh, uh, really uh, tried very intuitive. It just tests whether these groups, uh, biological and meaningful groups of metabolites or genes that are significantly enriched or significantly reduced in your data. Okay, uh, this is. Uh, exactly what we would like them to do, but we gave the name called the enrichment analysis. And uh, uh, what do we mean by biological meaningful? And we already mentioned about pathways, but uh, uh, as David mentioned, we have like a, a, a quarter of a million uh, metabolites, but we only have a much less number of have pathways. So we need to really expand the functions beyond pathways. So what are other possibilities? We can have some signatures that are associated with disease, disease signature uh, database. We also have some uh, SNP associated, uh, the metabolites. So we know if you change, mutate some SNPs or uh, associated with a lot of other compounds changes. So that means they are related. So these, these libraries, they are biological meaningful. So they are not as clear as how pathways exactly, but they are grouped. We know they are correlated. So they are uh, meaningful. So um, that's why we, uh, we uh, one of the reasons why metabolism was used uh, uh, quite a lot is that uh, we define a lot of a lot of the functions manually and curated from HMDB, from SMPDB, from CAG, from drug bank, uh, from uh, blood, uh, urine, CSF, uh, fecal, and we also collect from uh, gen genetic studies. We found a lot of the metabolites associated with SNPs. And we also know some of the chemical related uh, subclass, main class. 
So, um, and uh, all of this is meaningful. They help you refine uh, your hypothesis to a more narrow scope and, um, and to, to further doing testing. So this part here, we continue this update. So uh, we need to define the functions. The defined functions cannot be done ma manually. So this is a library is quite a, taking a lot of our time. I know uh, David doing this uh, database maintenance update uh, uh, quite a uh, effort. So we just make it more computable. We direct the call it from the uh, on the underlying database to do the testing. So uh, you can see uh, below there's options that um, only use metabolite sets containing at least two entries. Uh, and this is a more or less quite unique to uh, metabolomics. Why is that? Right? Uh, we talk about a metabolite set, we talk about functions, we talk about uh, groups. So we usually don't talk about single individual compounds. So the more groups you have and the more confidence this is function rather individual compounds. Unfortunately, metabolomics is still coverage is an issue. And a lot of the metabolite set it contains very few metabolites. So that's the things you need to pay attention to is that the functions when you define, you need to see how many hits. If you have more, and it means that function is more likely to be real. If you have very few, that means uh, um, you don't know uh, because metabolite can involve the multifunctions. If these functions really have one or two, uh, the definition, the boundary is not that clear. So uh, this is not compared to gene set. Gene set is much more have high coverage. They have 20, but metabolites, uh, so most of them have less number, okay? So uh, here that the figure just shows uh, how we think about functions. So functions are coordinated changes. So this is intuitively we think functions are carried out by groups of the metabolites, a group of genes. If they do that, they must talk to each other. Let's go out and watch a movie together and play soccer. So uh, in order to do that, they must do it, uh, have a pattern, it's not random. So they can be both on the top and left, up regulated or down regulated, all signature changing. So here I get a lot of questions. People ask, hey, uh, should all the metabolites be up regulated and uh, all down regulated? And the, the, my answer is uh, it depends. I also think a lot of metabolites, it could be product and a substitute. So uh, it's significantly changed. So direction in metabolomics, I don't think is that meaningful. So you just use, if you use a, a t-test score, try to use the absolute value. P-value is fine, P-value is not direction. So on gene expression, sometimes it's meaningful both up and down for metabolomics. Uh, I think directionality is not that uh, quite meaningful. So just uh, uh, just put it on ha hand. So here is that we show actually with the, from metabolomics, you can see the changes sometimes it's so strong. And uh, and uh, the features, especially some of the peaks and generally from thin compounds, that one must be sim similarly changed high. So if multiple peaks correspond in the same compounds, so they must be, higher or lower together because that's the same compound. And that's sometimes help us to annotate the peaks. They must change it together. Now we're talking about uh, uh, functions and we talk about the metabolite set. We talk about pathways and, uh, and they define the functions. Now we need to evaluate how these groups of uh, functions or uh, this uh, enriched. So, uh, So I mentioned it about how they do the enrichment and uh, hopefully in one direction, but we don't talk about direction, we talk about they change it, okay? And uh, compared to the random, as long as it's not random, they both either up and at bottom, it's all fine, metabolomics. And if we want to do the enrichment analysis in the statistics, you already have two uh, widely used algorithms. One is called over-representation analysis and uh, like a fish exact test or, or a hypergeometric test. So if you uh, uh, don't know, you can Google it. So it's a very um, uh, simple uh, stats, but it's very robust. So over-representation analysis. And they start from the significant compounds and uh, using a cutoff. So because if you want to test it, first you need to define uh, what's the, what are the significant compounds. And you can use 0.05, you can use 0.1, it's as long as you think that the meaningful, mean, meaningful groups to test. 
And also I can, I can let you know is you can always test the enrichment for any patterns, not just significant ones. You want to test a group of co-regulated genes, our genes, our metabolites change similarly. So you can just manually select that and define what functions enriched, okay? Uh, I'm just saying here, most people are testing a significant compound based on p-values, but you can test any compounds. If you see this group of 10 compounds, is changed together, both higher, both low. This, you can test what function involved, what function enriched. It's not related to statistical test. It relates to what you want to test for. If you want to find out this group of genes or compounds, you can always use this group to do the enrichment analysis. So you define it based on t-test, you can define it based on clustering, okay? The other one is called a, a gene set enrichment analysis. This is, a, this is a quite a common in, genomics or transcriptomics. So uh, this one is uh, uh, you use a complete ranked compound list and it's cutoff free. So in metabolomics, you can call, talk about the uh, metabolite set enrichment analysis because we use metabolite set. But the in, input will be the ranked compound list as not a significant ones. What they try to test, whether the top or bottom is highly enriched for certain functions. Why did we do in, why they do this is because they think when we do a significant cutoff, whatever we are doing, that's arbitrary, okay? And you use 0.1, you use 0.05, you use 0.01, you can potentially get different results. What they use as gene set or GSEA is they try to avoid this. You use a completed rank, just want to see the top or bottom, whether there's some themes enriched. So it's cutoff free and it seems to be more, in, more how to say, uh, less subjective, but in reality, they are complementary, okay? I, I think both of them is uh, useful, okay? Uh, mm, uh, cut off free and cut, mm, relying on cut is all useful. So no, no need to just choose, I have to do this, not doing that. So functional analysis in metabolomics, uh, we use a lot what we learned from transcriptomics. And if you're doing a compound concentration, you're almost doing some sim similar like uh, gene expression profiling. And you can directly upload the compound concentration table and do enrichment analysis against the pathways or gene uh, metabolite set. And to test whether the conditions are uh, significantly changed under the conditions. So uh, it's really smooth and streamlined. Uh, slightly more challenges on target metabolomics. How can we do that? One reason is that we cannot directly map in peaks to the pathways, right? This is because we can do the genes because gene can map into the gene set then based, based on names. And uh, targeted metabolomics can match the metabolite set based on names. But we cannot match in peaks to that uh, uh, pathways because the pathways defined by metabolites and pathways not defined by peaks. Can we do that? So uh, this is part is uh, puzzling a, a lot of people and they think uh, uh, that uh, is the main challenge. And we will tell you we can actually get around that uh, easily uh, with high resolution mass spec uh, result. And uh, here we just focus on the targeted metabolomics uh, for this uh, uh, session. The next one we focus on, on targeted, how we do that. So in metabolic analyst, we have actually three different modes to do the enrichment analysis. or um, And so we follow, the one is if you give a list of metabolite names, uh, we just do the regular over reference analysis. So this list of names could be generated from your t-test, ANOVA, or could be generated from your clustering result. You want, want how these compounds are involved, co-regulated. The other one is called SSP. It's a list of metabolite names plus concentration data. And uh, this one is unique to target metabolomics because you can compare your concentration against the reference standard, which is like a clinical chemistry in uh, defined by the textbook. You can compare it to that. So this is uh, really make it uh, how do you diagnose it, uh, glu uh, using glucose to diagnose diabetes because there is a reference standard. If your glucose is married, absolute concentration is the stuff, you can do this diagnosis. It's not possible with untargeted. Okay, and the last one is called the quantitative enrichment analysis, QEA, which is similar to GSEA. We want to directly upload the table and we don't, you don't need to do any cutoff. We just use a global test algorithms. 
which is a uh, similarly designed to GSA, but is more sensitive. And uh, so here's a uh, uh, stuff how you go to metabolomics. One is uh, oral reference analysis, single sample profiling, and quantitative enrichment analysis. So the over representation analysis is uh, you need to do some uh, result. You select the interest compounds, and it's going to compare to the metabolite set libraries and do an enrichment analysis using the hypergeometric test, and you get it uh, ranked in pathways. And if you're doing a single sample profiling, you're going to compare with the normal references. And this is from uh, SM, uh, HMDV, and you can get some normal ranges. So if you're really high, and uh, you think it's abnormal. And uh, if it's a signature within a pathway, uh, several compound within a pathway change, and you will detect the pathways. So this is the uh, same thing. QGA is very streamlined. You upload a common comp compound constituent table. It will assess the changes and test with a metabolized library and give you results. So overall, that uh, we put uh, all the different input and we have algorithms and uh, they will do the comparison with the metabolite set library and give the report. So you can upload a compound list and you will need to also upload a comp. This is for over representation analysis. If you do a single sample profile, you need to list plus the concentration because the reference standard is you have a unit. So you need to make sure the unit is the same, okay? And uh, here it shows this uh, uh, micro, mm, uh, urine normalized to uh, creatinine. So you, you really, you need to have a unit which is absolute concentration uh, with the um, standard unit so you can compare. <clears throat> so here is that shows uh, if you upload a compound with the concentration and you can compare with uh, 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 what's reported range. So you can see here is a lot of literature uh, reported range and some of them you see, oh, uh, this is high, it's low compared to the literature. And uh, why it can, this is all the result based on the uh, textbook from the literature mining and the collected by the HMDB. And you see that it said, oh, this is high. And why it's high? Because we have uh, 10 studies. They are talking about this range, you know, each individual study, different regions, different uh, cohort, they have different uh, uh, confidence interval, have different mean values. So there are a lot of difference. But yours, if you marry like this, you're, you're very sure it's very high. So whether there's environment is wrong or actually disease uh, markers, it's all clear here. But what I'm saying is if you want to do such things, is you need to really have a higher uh, extreme values to see this. A lot of time you will see you're actually part of this. <laughs> uh, probably overlap with something with one, some studies and different from other studies. So it really require every study re reporting and using a similar uh, technology and uh, all absolute quantification. So it uh, really require a lot of the uh, community effort. So from the enrichment analysis, uh, we do the over representation analysis of global GSEA test, and we can get the pathways. And you can see the pathway is going to be uh, ranked from the top to the bottom. Basically, the top is the most significant. And they also have the color based on probably most the significant fold change, average fold change. And you just let you to choose. But you need to understand that a lot of pathways, they share the same compounds. So some compounds, oh, these two pathways are both significant, we report them. But you can see that uh, the underlying compound, the same set of underlying compounds, it's the same, almost you're talking about the same thing, but you reported it twice, one for com pathway A, one for com pathway two. Uh, pathway B. So this is uh, quite a common. Uh, a lot, another visualization we show is called the enrichment map. What they try to do is uh, put the different pathways linked to each other. If the pathways share a lot of common compounds, they will be linked. So in overall, that uh, this to give you a separate, the first one is clean, but it could hide some information. And the second one is slightly more informative because they tell you which pathway is more correlated. You can actually click on a particular pathways that uh, to show that uh, who is the un common underlying compounds. So if you choose the um, biomarkers, it will help you prioritize them. So people keep asking, well, what's the difference between metabolite set enrichment analysis and pathway analysis? So the enrichment analysis part is the same, but pathway have actual information. It's called the structures. So uh, if we know the structures, we actually can get actual confidence about where the pathway changed. So for example, if this is a, a graphics, and we see the structure like this. And we know if the compound changes at this 
edge and versus changing at the center, at here and the red or blue nodes, they have different consequences. So if you change this one and it's knock out this uh, metabolites or enzymes or genes uh, uh, stuff, you have a big uh, influence on the whole pathway. So this is a more uh, things we feel intuitively is supposed to give you some feelings about whether this pathway is enriched. If the same compound, one pathway have this compound change, the one pathway have this compound change, and you should really know that uh, uh, this one is more likely to change the whole pathway. This will probably downstream and not affect the whole pathway, right? So this is a, uh, this is really um, intuitive uh, um, information we combine. How do we measure them? The graph theory, they have a degree centrality, they have between and centrality. So the high degree, and this means a half, and the high between this, it means a bottleneck. So they are all important measures. So what we what we want to do is that we uh, didn't give you a combined scores together, just to tell, tell you what to, to do. But we, uh, what we have done is make it transparent, it just give you a new dimension. Here is your p-values. We just rank them from top to bottom. If most significant, it will be ranked on the top. But we give you an actual dimension of pathway impact. So if the change of the metabolites is more likely in the most significant, the strategically important location, we will be spreading out to this group. So if you see the comp, uh, metabolite both significant and have a lot of changes, this signal change also at important locations, you will find out the compounds, this pathway is more likely to be changed, okay? So here, if you click this compound, uh, click this node, and you can see a lot of compounds significant, and a lot of the compounds actually in the location that seems upstream and in the center. So more likely this pathway is affected, okay? So the part, the part is that we pathway give you actual information to let you feel whether this is uh, uh, based on structure. And you can click it to see how many compounds are actually involved. Um, but this one visualizing help you know not only as a group, you also know the location, upstream, downstream, center, or peripheral. So this is a pathway information give you more, um, more confidence about biology because you know the structure. <clears throat> and the final is that uh, uh, report generation. So a lot of people uh, use the tools and they want to have uh, saved the whole process. And we do have a PDF report generation and embedding results. So if you get in the result and uh, you want to go, you go to the last page download, you can see general report or general for you. But the thing that uh, once you generate report, it's static, you cannot label it. And you, it's not interactive. Interactive is online, okay? Once you generate, it becomes static. This is unfortunate, but overall that you have to uh, <clears throat> accept uh, the uh, offline is, is uh, more static. How you do it, you actually put this in a PowerPoint, start manually label them before you forget. So in the online, you mouse over, you will know what name is up. So you want to put a publication, you put it in the PowerPoint or GIMP and label this a few pathways. We can actually label everything in the computer, but you won't be able to read it. So the ways which one you want to emphasize, you just label it, it's not too hard to do that. Now, we covered how we do it for the target metabolomics, and can we do the similar way to untargeted metabolomics? So uh, the answer is yes. So we tried hard, and uh, for the community, almost 10 years, I think nowadays community start accepting we can actually do the similar things using for untargeted metabolomics. Assumptions that you need to use uh, high resolution LCMS. So uh, if we don't do it, what we did uh, earlier days before we uh, uh, just uh, do the functions using untargeted metabolomics, you collect the spectra, you do the cleaning, we do the peak picking alignment. And uh, uh, yeah, if you do a lot of things, it takes uh, quite a long and uh, large data. And doing the peak annotation, it takes weeks to months. If you really want to uh, use a standard to get it, it takes years, okay? After you identify, I know the most of them, you can actually understand the functions. So this part is actually the most uh, time consuming and it require a lot of deep knowledge about mass spec. So it really prevents people from using uh, LCMS based metabolomics. It really slow down things. And if we talk about genomics, uh, rna sick, everybody understand ATGC, but nobody understand peaks. And from peaks to compounds, it's really uh, take a lot of analytical chemistry knowledge. Um, but how can we accelerate that and make it easier? So what we think is that with high resolution peak, we can actually do a putative annotation directly using the peak 
uh, uh, high reduction MS potentially use some retention time to directly map into the pathways and the potential compounds. We can do that uh, with errors. Yes. And so, um, so um, what we realized, uh, uh, this is published by my collaborator, uh, Dr. Shu Zhao Li from Analysis in Jackson Laboratory, what they found the concept is like a GSEA. If, if we do see a function uh, changes, the function must be coordinated. So if we map in the peaks to that, uh, to that compound uh, in the pathways, they must have a pattern, okay? It's not random. So such a pattern will jointly point out to that pathways we are looking for. So individual compound, if you match these peaks to that uh, compound and to that pathways, you do have errors. But as long as error is random, and uh, if you have a high random peaks, majority still point to the right direction. So this is, uh, you can do a simulation and we can see clearly that's true. And actually we see, we did a recently, we did a simulation study. We found out as long as 13%, uh, 25 to 30% of the, uh, picks you annotated right, remaining is random. We can almost, almost 100%, we can recall that pathway, no problem at all. So we do, as long as you have certain percentage of accurate uh, peak to compound uh, stuff, even uh, like say 13%, and we can find that pathway accurately. So this is uh, quite a, uh, quite a, quite as comforting because we use the tools and we try to do simulation and we found out exactly what we, uh, thought it should work, and the threshold is about uh, thirty percent. Okay, and all the remaining is random, so it doesn't impact result. So this is how Mamichov works. So the algorithm uh, developed by Shujali is Mamich, uh, called Mamichov, and in Metaba Analyst we call it a peak set enrichment analysis, it's called PSEA, because exactly with using a peak set to define whole pathways. Um, but if you respect the original, it's called Mamichov, and so. What we try to do is like similarly we have done with uh, empirical p-value uh, calculating. So we just use this raw uh, original data and we use them to map into the possible pathways and see which pathways in which, okay? Now we actually randomly draw from the whole peak list, whole peak list, same size, okay? Same size, uh, not just using a significant one. Here we just see if we use a cutoff like uh, six peaks, like eight peaks here and we test which uh, pathway is uh, enriched. Now we don't do that. Uh, uh, this is original. Now we do permutation. It's randomly select uh, from the whole peak list and do the pathway enrichment analysis uh, again and again. So just randomly do it again and again. And eventually we'll see the original one, how robust it is. So we get a p-values. Overall, that uh, the first one, is better you use high random peak, you'll be able to identify that uh, enriched pathway, no problem. Uh, what with the remaining ones if actually give you a confidence how randomly you can get that one, okay? So the first one already give you an answer. The remaining ones give you now distribution and calculating p-values. Uh, overall, that uh, it requires a high resolution mass spectrometry. So we're talking about the whole peaks, uh, probably 3,000, 2,500 higher. If you have peaks very low and the confidence won't be that good. And we also talk about, uh, if we talk about 3,000 peaks, how much uh, peaks to identify the pathway? We talk about the ten percent. We talk about the three hundred peaks. Uh, you don't need to care about key values. You just talk about ranking based on the uh, uh, fold change or, or, or p values. Top ten percent. We will try to identify what the most likely peaks uh, pathways involved. You cannot select like here. We show it's eight. It's not eight peaks. It, it ha had to be a meaningful number of the whole high relevant peaks, like 3,000, you have a significant ones need to be several hundred to, ident to, uh, to identify them using uh, uh, untargeted metabolomics. All we need is multiple groups, multiple information, high resolution ones. So, uh, so this is the last part it shows that uh, <clears throat> uh, the things we just validated, uh, Mamichog, uh, against the, the several other tools, one is called GSEA, and we just basically adapt in GSEA approach, see how good they are compared to Mamichok. Actually, found Mamichok is much more sensitive. It just uh, really, a lot of the uh, things they designed is specific for metabolomics and make it very powerful and sensitive. And uh, we have, uh, this is simulation result. So we have about like 13%, we almost at 95%, 98%, all the pathways perturbed that we know uh, it's changed because we did a simulation. We know the ground truth. We can identify them just at about 30%. We get it. So this is a quite a 
satisfying. So we know um, actually that um, using high resolution on target metabolomics, we can get the functions very accurately. Disregarding individual compounds, we're not getting the accurately, but we can get the function accurately. So, so this is a functional analysis uh, um, page and uh, uh, modules. You are going to click here and upload your um, peak intensity tables or ranked peak list. Okay, it's complete peak list, not just significant ones. And uh, so one of the things we always get people's questions that um, um, they try and they didn't read the tutorials, they didn't attend our workshops, they just didn't, didn't get a good result. And they tell us to help them. And actually, I'm just repeating again, again, high resolution uh, MS uh, is really critical and you'll get a very accurate result and need to upload a complete peak list. And if people, you have total just a few hundred peaks and we would assume that's just only second peaks. And uh, a function is groups and the function is really a group behavior. So we need a multiple peaks to talk about it, talking the same peaks, same, uh, same pathways to get that confidence. So this is not a big deal if you're really using Obichev at all and to get there. And uh, so get a result, you actually see the potential hits. Uh, what the putative annotated, what's the result look like? You can see the result are quite similar to uh, uh, quite similar to the um, uh, targeted. So we actually try it to be consistent, okay? And in between there's some uh, possibilities of fuzzy mapping, but it's all hidden under the interface. You don't need to know. What uh, we would like you to know is the result is robust and it's accurate. You can find it, definitely find it where it's mapped, um, but uh, the, it's, it's um, we do a lot of the simulation mappings. So here's some interpretation of the result because we get a lot of <coughs> user questions from the forum. So uh, p values, we actually give Fisher and gamma. Gamma is more from the uh, distribution from permutation. What I would like to see is that the function um, ranking is uh, quite uh, accurate. It's uh, just p values, which are more uh, accurate. And uh, fish, you, you should trust. A gamma, you can trust, but uh, because it's public server, we only test in 100 times. So if you have uh, more and it's down the time, it's probably better. So that's I'm seeing sometimes the gamma distribution is supposed to be more robust, but it's um, depending on the permutation time. The server only give 100 or 200. So this is GSEA. GSEA actually can consider both up and down. You get a result. You have more hits, you see like this. So um, you can actually see from here, what's the underlying compounds from the hit from the match. And you see how many uh, annotations like um, isotopes and adducts and you see this. So if you are really understanding LCMS and this one also make you happy because you know that's like this to be real. So, so here's uh, another one is that uh, you can actually see your uh, peaks as a uh, heat map table. And this heat map table allow you actually clustering, hierarchical clustering. You see any patterns, use a mouse to drag, select. The strong pattern will show up on the center. This is your focus view. It's the overall view. And if you see the real whole peak, it will be much longer. But here just shows how you can select from these patterns and show up in the center is the focus. Now you can test, use a mommy chalk. Not this here is not significant peaks. It's just the peaks with the interesting patterns you would like to know. And you will test which pathway is enriched. So we just let you know that uh, all of this allow you to do uh, very free to, freely to do any of the patterns from the peaks and get the functions. So the annotation, a lot of this, you see the annotation. If you click these peaks, you'll see some annotations right beside this uh, individual peaks and uh, adducts, isotopes and stuff. It will tell you this is most likely to be. It, it's not 100%, but it will try the best what it most likely to be. Once you see this one hit by so many different things, yes, individual could be wrong, but collectively they are correct. So this is the answer. So next one, we are going to ready for the lab almost. So the lab session going to be in two for two hours. We, right? So um, this is uh, we are on a break now. <laughs>